In the previous video, we examined life history variation and how animals differ in their patterns of growth, maturation, and reproduction, in large part due to different uh, lifespan potentials. And in this video, we're going to examine in more detail the different ways that animals do reproduce. Well, the first type of reproduction we're going to talk about is asexual reproduction, where a single parent gives rise to genetically identical young. This is the original cloning. So asexual animals, the parents produce offspring that are genetically identical to themselves. Now there are many ways that different organisms can do this. You can talk about binary and multiple fission. We'll talk about this when we talk about groups before animals, when we talk briefly about protozoans. And in binary and multiple fission, the parent basically just splits in two if it's binary fission, or if it's multiple fission, they split into more than two individuals that become the offspring. So in this situation, there is no parent left. The parent basically splits into two or more offspring. And these offspring are about equal in size. Now budding is very similar. The parent individual basically has um, little branches of itself that break off to form offspring individuals. So this is a budding hydra, a type of cnidarian that we'll cover later in the semester. So this is similar to binary fission or multiple fission in that you're producing offspring that are genetically identical from the parent individual, but now the parent oftentimes still remains as existing and you're producing much smaller but genetically identical offspring. Fragmentation is very similar to budding because you're just breaking off a part of the adult individual, but fragmentation is a more haphazard process so that if the animal is actually damaged and a piece of it breaks off, then it forms into a new individual. So budding is more of a directed process where it's, it's breaking off a part of its body to form a new individual fragmentation is if a boat comes by and, and runs into this sponge and breaks off a piece. So it's, it's effectively the same thing uh, in the results. And this is seen in things like sponges and anemones. Now sometimes eggs are involved in the production of genetic clones. And this is what we call amyotic parthenogenesis, where a female in this case, a, a female rotifer produces an egg, but instead of the typical egg situation in which eggs are haploid, have, which means that they have half the amount of genetic material of the adult, they produce diploid eggs. And this diploid egg turns into a genetic clone of the female. So it's a female laying a diploid egg that produces another diploid, genetically identical female. And we're going to cover the difference between mitosis and meiosis here in just a little bit. But one of the primary differences is the content of the DNA of the cells that are resulting from either mitosis or meiosis. And in mitosis, you're producing cells that have exactly the same amount of DNA and are exactly the same type of DNA, so producing clones. Now let's move on to talking about sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction involves the formation of young, typically by the union of haploid gametes, which we call the sex cells. And we typically designate them as either sperm or eggs. And by definition, the sperm are the smaller, more mobile gametes, and the eggs are the larger, less mobile gametes. As I mentioned, these gametes are haploid, which means that they have half the amount of DNA as the adult. So, when you get a sperm and an egg put together, an N plus an N gets you back to the diploid 2N number. The type of sexual reproduction you're most familiar with is what we call the dioecious condition or bisexual reproduction, in which both of the parents are separate individuals, either male, which by definition produce sperm, and the females, which by definition produce eggs or ova, which is singular for that, is an ovum. However, many animals are what we call monoecious, the monoecious condition or hermaphroditism, where an individual has both sets of sex organs. So an individual is not male or female, it's both male and female. 
And so here you can see two mating earthworms, which are both accepting sperm from each other to fertilize their own eggs. And lastly, sexual reproduction can occur through meiotic parthenogenesis. So remember when we talked about amyotic parthenogenesis, we were talking about making clones from diploid eggs. Well, in meiotic parthenogenesis, this is a special case where females produce haploid eggs, like typical sexual individuals, but these eggs develop directly into young. And this is seen in a diverse group of organisms, some fish, some flatworms, insects. And because the eggs are haploid, the eggs are developed via meiosis, which means they're genetically diverse. So all of the offspring that are produced by the female producing these haploid eggs, all of the, these females are producing offspring that are different from each other. So that's how meiotic parthenogenesis and amyotic parthenogenesis differ. Amyotic parthenogenesis, remember, is producing clones, diploid clones, and meiotic parthenogenesis is using haploid eggs to produce genetically diverse, non-clonal individuals. Now, it's still sexual reproduction despite the fact that it doesn't require male genes. Okay, so we're not combining two haploid gametes to produce diploid individuals. Now, in some cases, it may or may not need to be the egg have to be activated by the sperm so that the sperm may kind of kickstart reproduction or the, the development of the young, but the sperm DNA is not actually involved in the process. And lastly, it is a haploid egg that is involved in the initial development of the individual, but the diploid condition can be achieved by duplication of chromosomes uh, later in development. So a classic example of meiotic parthenogenesis is seen in honeybees. Okay, so the queen bee in a colony is the only reproductive female. Before she establishes the colony, she flies out from her home colony and mates with a male. And then she comes back with a stored sperm and begins the production of individuals for the colony. Now she can produce two types of individuals. She can use her eggs and then the stored sperm that she has to combine those two haploid gametes to produce a diploid individual. These all are females and they become workers in the colony. And by far the vast majority of the bees that are in a honeybee colony are diploid workers. But during the reproductive season, she will lay eggs that are not fertilized. These therefore are haploid eggs that develop directly into males. These are, uh, in the honeybee world, are called the drones, haploid drones, which are males, that they then fly off and mate with other queens that uh, are trying to establish new colonies. So we've talked about the diversity of, of ways that organisms reproduce, either sexually or asexually. If you look in the animal kingdom, we'll see that most of the animals are reproducing sexually. So let's try to address that question. Why are most animals reproducing sexually? And you may be thinking, well, you know, I don't understand what's the relevance of the question. Well, from an evolutionary point of view and an ecological point of view, there are several advantages to asexual reproduction. One is you don't need a partner. And so it's faster. Just when the conditions are right to reproduce, you just reproduce. Now, to contrast that, in sexual species, you have to find a mate, convince them to mate, and this takes time and energy. So that's a huge advantage to asexual reproduction. The other thing is that in asexual reproduction, all the individuals are potentially reproductive. So the population can grow faster. Now in sexual species, again, just to contrast that, males, well, they're involved in the reproductive process, but they don't actually produce individuals. Remember, they're just contributing sperm to females, and the females are the ones that are producing the eggs that develop into the offspring. And so if you compare two lineages, one of which is a unisexual and the other is a bisexual from individuals in bisexual populations, the unisexual population can grow much faster as demonstrated in a study of whiptail lizards. Some populations are asexual, unisexual populations, all females. 
who reproduce asexually and they if you start off with a very small population can grow much faster than the bisexual population and again the reason for that is the asexual population or unisexual population is all females so they can every, every time they produce an individual it's a female that can produce other females which can produce more reproductives but in the bisexual population if they're producing the same number of offspring typically half of those are going to be males that can't reproduce like the females can. Another advantage of asexual reproduction is individuals are producing clones of themselves, meaning they're passing on 100% of their genes. In sexual species, because the gametes go through the process of meiosis, cutting the, num the amount of DNA in half are only passing on 50% of their DNA for each gamete that they produce. Now why does this matter? Well, remember in earlier lectures I mentioned the fact that in evolutionary terms, success is measured by the number of your genes you pass on to subsequent generation. So in asexual reproduction, you're passing on 100% of your genes, twice the amount of DNA that you're passing on via sexual reproduction. So again, in asexual reproduction, through mitosis, you're passing on clones of, of yourself, 100% of your DNA, and through meiosis in the production of gametes, you're taking a 2N individual and reducing the amount of DNA to produce gametes that only have half the amount of DNA. So again, most animals reproduce sexually. Why go sexual? We've talked about all the advantages there are to asexual reproduction. Well, to really understand this, we have to review how gametes are formed. So this is going to require us to look in a little more detail about mitosis versus meiosis. We've already reviewed the fact that mitosis is producing 2N cells and meiosis is producing haploid cells. But mitosis is also giving rise to identical diploid DNA content. Now, mitosis is happening in all your cells and all animal cells are doing this in what we call the somatic cells. Okay, this is how skin cells reproduce themselves and liver cells and, and, and so forth. All of your body cells, that's what somatic means. But this is also how eggs are produced in asexual organisms. So in this case, again, the parents are producing offsprings that are genetically clones of themselves via mitosis. 2N individual produces, through mitosis, 2N offspring and the DNA is identical. But meiosis does it differently. It gives rise to haploid cells with variable DNA content among individual offspring that are produced. So meiosis produces the gamete or the sex cells in most organisms. We're going after two things in the process of meiosis. One, cutting the DNA in half, right, going from 2N to 1N, but then also producing offspring that are genetically diverse. So we're going from 2N through meiosis to 1N. So we're cutting the amount of DNA in half. But additionally, as you can see here in this diagram, you may start off with chromosomes that are of these uh, two different types. So we've got the uh, large chromosomes and the smaller chromosomes. And then you've got a red one and a, uh, a black one in the matched pair. But by the time you end up going through all of the stages of meiosis, look in the four cells that are going to be formed here. One, you're cutting the amount of DNA in half, okay, so going from 2N to 1N, but notice now you have combinations of red and black that differ from the original cells. That's where the genetic diversity comes into play. You're producing offspring that are genetically diverse. So how does this genetic diversity become developed? Well, it happens in two stages. The first is what's called crossing over. This occurs in the very first phase of meiosis called prophase 1. And by the way, you might want to get another textbook. Your, your zoology text doesn't do a very good job of describing this process, but just get online, Google meiosis, uh, watch a few videos to, to try to get a better understanding of the different stages. The first phase, again, is prophase 1. And in prophase 1, crossing over occurs. This is where you get swapping of chromosome segments between what are called homologous chromosomes. All right, well, what is a homologous chromosome? Organisms have different numbers of chromosomes, and they come in pairs. The pairs that are the same type are called homologous chromosomes. 
So for example, in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have chromosome uh, 1, we have chromosome 2, and so forth. Let's say that this is chromosome 1 in humans. Okay, we have one copy which you got from mom, one copy that you got from dad. And on these two copies, you have the same genes. So we have the X gene locus, the Y gene locus, and the Z gene locus. A locus is a spot on the DNA where a specific gene is located. Okay. But you can have different versions of these genes. So notice on one of these chromosomes we have capital X, Y, and Z, which typically in genetics refers to a dominant type of gene. And then on the other one we have the lowercase, okay, which typically uh, indicates a recessive type gene. Now these different versions of these genes are called alleles. But what happens in crossing over is these homologous chromosomes switch segments. This produces different combinations of alleles among genes within a chromosome type. So within chromosome type 1, now at the X locus, we're going to produce some combinations of big X with a little y and a little z. And on another of the haploid gametes that are going to be formed, we're going to produce a big X with a little y and a big Z. So this is showing us we're producing four cells in the end that have half the amount of DNA. See, there's just one copy of each of these chromosomes, and they're genetically diversified from what we started off with. We had just chromosomes that had all the dominants or all the recessives, and now we have all these different combinations. That's the key to sexual reproduction, is the production of genetically diverse individuals. In prophase one, via crossing over, is one way in which that occurs. We're getting genetic diversity within a chromosome type among the different gene loci. Now there's another kind of geographic scale at which we can get this genetic diversity via independent assortment. Now this happens in a later stage, what was what is called metaphase one, where the homologous chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell before it divides in two and separates. But how the chromosomes in the homologous pairs line up is independent of each other. That's why it's called independent assortment. So this bigger pair over here, let's say that the light blue, and you can tell that they've already undergone crossing over because they've swapped segments here. But the primarily light blue one is lined up on the top, and the dark blue one is lined up on the bottom. But that doesn't have anything to do with how the other chromosome pairs will line up. So here we have a smaller set of homologous chromosomes, a different chromosome type, where it just so happens that the dark blue ones are on top and the light blue ones are on bottom. But every time a, you're forming a gamete through meiosis, this will happen in different ways. How one assorts has no effect on how the others assort, and so you always end up getting different combinations of alleles among genes across different chromosome types. Okay, so that's, that's one of the things that I want you to know. We're producing genetic diversity in the offspring in the end, but that can happen at two geographic scales within the cell. Crossing over produces genetic diversity within chromosome types, and independent assortment produces different combinations of alleles among genes across different chromosome types. All right, so let's get back to our question of what, what's better, sexual versus asexual reproduction. We've already talked about the advantages of asexual reproduction, but this really points to the key advantage of sexual reproduction. Genetic diversity is created by meiosis, which allows sexual lineages to produce genetically diverse offspring. These lineages can therefore adapt more quickly to changing environmental conditions. So, sexual lineages have a faster potential rate of adaptive evolution, which gives them a lower probability of extinction. So that's the, the real key. In the long run, you're slower, it's less efficient, you're not passing on as many copies of your genes, but by producing genetic diversity, you're not putting all of your eggs in one genetic basket. And so some of your offspring may not be a good fit into the next generation, Others might have just the right genetic combination to be very successful.
Now it turns out some animals have the best of both worlds. They have the capability to reproduce asexual and sexual. So here's an example of this. We've already gone through the top part of this uh, in the past. Asexual reproduction in rotifers in stable environments where they go through amiotic parthenogenesis. So the females are producing eggs that are diploid that turn in just to a, another genetic clone female. And as long as the environment is stable, if they're doing good, then fine. Just produce lots of individuals that are just like you and they'll do fine as well. But if there's environmental challenges that are occurring, it might be better to, to hedge your bets and produce offspring that are genetically diverse. Well, how do they do that? They're all female populations. In challenging environments, the females will produce, via meiosis, haploid eggs. And all of those that are unfertilized become males. These males then mate with the remaining diploid females in the population, and any subsequent haploid egg that is produced that becomes fertilized becomes then a 2N individual that begins developing into a female. So this process of initially producing these uh, haploid eggs that can develop directly into males, that is meiotic parthenogenesis. And all of these males have differing genetic combinations via independent assortment and crossing over. So we're producing genetic diversity and allowing these males to then mate with other individual females in the population that have other genetic combinations to combine those to produce a new population of females and if the environment stabilizes they'll go back to amiotic parthenogenesis. Alright, let's talk about the anatomy itself now. The parts of the reproductive structure that produces the gametes are called gonads. Males have testes which produce sperm, females have ovaries which produce ova or eggs. So in the testes the process of spermatogenesis produces the sperm. The initial cells involved in this process are called spermatogonia. They're diploid. They're somatic cells that are diploid. But they produce, via meiosis, four haploid sperm cells. As you can see from this diagram, starting with the uh, spermatogonium, diploid, it then duplicates, showing uh, here, the number of arms increasing. And it says here that they're diploid, but at this point actually it's tetraploid. It's four copies of the DNA. It then undergoes meiosis one and meiosis two, and really they should be showing you various combinations of the red and blue here, right, because of crossing over, but they're not showing that just to simplify things. Just showing you how the numbers reduce. So the end product, we, well we start off in this spermatogonium, a diploid spermatogonium, and we end up producing four haploid, genetically diverse sperm cells. The sperm cells themselves are highly modified cells, uh, modified for locomotion and penetration of the egg or ovum to deliver the, the payload in this case is the DNA, the haploid uh, genome. And you can break it into three segments. First, there's the head which is broken down into the nucleus where the DNA is located and then this little packet of lysis proteins at the, at the very top of the head which is called the acrosome. This is involved in helping the sperm to penetrate the ovum. And we'll talk about this in the next lecture. The next section of the uh, sperm is the midpiece which is packed with mitochondria. And mitochondria, if you remember from cell biology, is the organelle associated with the production of ATP. So this is the powerhouse of the cell. This is what gives the sperm the ability to, to swim long distances in the process of delivering this DNA to the egg. Now, so if that's the, the, the powerhouse delivering the energy, the propeller is the tail, which is the flagellum. And you can see that the, the flagellum in some species is kind of a curly cue, in others it's more of a straight uh, whip-like structure, so there's some variety uh, in the morphology of the tail. But this is basically the propeller that allows the sperm to swim.
Now let's move on to the female reproductive structures. Oogenesis, the production of eggs, occurs in ovaries. And again, you can either use the term ova or eggs. The initial cells in this process are oogonia, which are diploid, as you can see here. They then duplicate to become uh, tetraploid. Then we undergo meiosis I and meiosis II to produce four structures. But in this case, they're different from four functional sperm that we saw in spermatogenesis. In oogenesis, we form four cells, but only one of those is going to be a functional haploid egg or ovum. The other two or three, sometimes this one here doesn't actually uh, split, and so you may just end up producing two, but you either produce two or three non-functional uh, haploid, what are called polar bodies. These are, are non-functional. You're only going to get one functional haploid egg out of uh, this process of oogenesis. Well, why are we only forming one egg? We produce four sper fun functional sperm. Why aren't we just uh, making these non-functional polar bodies? Well, there's a premium in ova production to have large amounts of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is this uh, genetic information that's going to help the developing embryo develop really quickly and produce proteins after fertilization takes place. And the ova wants to be big so that it contain lots of lipids and protein in the yolk so that the developing embryo will have that food reserve. And so uh, it's just basically more efficient in the production of eggs to combine all this into one large ovum as possible to concentrate that material in one cell. And so we produce one ovum and then these others are just side products of the process of meiosis the polar bodies. Alright, as we go through the different lineages of animals, we'll talk about different patterns of offspring production. We'll see that some animals, the females uh, produce eggs that are basically shed into the environment for development. And this is by far the most common pattern in animals and it's called oviparous. Ova refers to egg, paris it, uh, refers to birth. So it's basically giving birth to eggs directly into the environment. Now, these young ha have to basically survive on their own typically. Nourishment is derived from the egg's yolk. And mating can either be uh, internal or external. So the uh, eggs can be shed out in the environment and then males will shed sperm over those to fertilize them. Or there can be mating between the male and the female so that the egg is fertilized and then released in the environment. And again, this is the majority of animals. Think about your typical insect the female here laying eggs into the environment. Another pattern of offspring production is ovoviviparous. So ovo referring to egg, vivi refers to live, paris birth. So it's egg production associated with live birth. It's similar to, to oviparous in that you're producing eggs that contain a relatively large amount of yolk, so nutrition is derived from the egg's yolk uh, for the young, but the eggs are actually retained in the body during development so that when they hatch, the mother produces them via live birth. Okay, so that's really the big difference between ovoviviparous and oviparous. Eggs are very similar, but in this case, the uh, egg is just retained in the body. It's not shed into the environment for development. But because the egg is retained in the body, this typically requires internal fertilization. So what are some examples of ovoviviparous animals? Well, think about um, guppies in uh, an aquarium. The females will retain the eggs within their body, and then those eggs hatch inside the body, and live birth of, of little fish uh, occurs. But the typical live birth that you think about is associated with viviparous animals. Viviparity is similar to ovoviviparity. The eggs are retained in the body during development. Live birth occurs, but the nutritional source for the developing embryos differs. In the case of ovoviviparity, remember that's coming from the egg's yolk itself. But in viviparity, there's some connection between the mother's system 
and the developing embryo so that the embryo is being nourished directly from the female's physiology. And this also typically is associated with internal fertilization. And the classic example that you're most familiar with is mammalian reproduction where there is a placenta that connects the maternal blood supply to the developing young. And then when the young is, is ready to be born, we have live birth. Now reproduction in most animals is a seasonal event. Timing is set uh, to maximize offspring survival. So for birds, the group that I study, um, the most common uh, time for reproduction is late spring and early summer where resources such as uh, insects and spiders, which serve as a good food base for developing young, is maximized uh, so they can find lots of nice protein-rich food to feed their young. So there are a lot of physiological changes in animals throughout the year. When they're not reproducing, animals have their reproductive structures greatly reduced in, in size. But there are certain environmental cues that trigger the production of hormones, and these uh, cues could be changes in photo period, meaning day length. So as days get longer, it triggers hormones to begin the uh, ramming up of the reproductive physiology and the reproductive anatomy. Rainfall can also be another trigger for this. So in desert living organisms, as rains come in and begin to produce uh, plant growth, which increases the development of, of insects, that triggers uh, animals to begin ramping up their reproductive effort. Or it could be temperature related. Temperatures increase, it may increase the reproductive capacity of organisms. So this ramping up of hormones stimulates the development of various aspects of the anatomy and physiology of organisms. So it begins the growth of the gonads. Um, so this would be the testes and the ovaries. An example of that, squirrels typically reproduce one or two times a year, depending on their range. And you can tell when the reproductive season is because the males, when they're non-reproductive, have their testes sucked up into their body. That's probably a good thing. Uh, all the guys will uh, understand this uh, analogy. You know, not having the testes uh, hanging out there in, in dangerous situation, banging around while you're we're climbing up and down trees. Um, the, the only reason that they are out during the reproductive season is because sperm are very temperature dependent. The, the survival of sperm is very temperature dependent, and if they get too warm, it can make them immobile or kill them. Okay, and so putting the testes, when they're functional, when spermatogenesis is occurring, you have to put them into uh, a scrotum to try to keep them cool. But if you're not using them, back up into the body cavity, right? Um, so that's, that's some of the seasonal aspect of reproduction. And so both males and females, and the other thing is you, if you're not using a part of your anatomy, it takes a lot of, of energy resources, uh, food resources, to keep those things going. If you're not using them, go ahead and let them regress so they're not costing you energy resources. So both testes and ovaries grow during the breeding season and regress during the non-breeding season. But that also goes for accessory sexual structures, structures that don't necessarily produce the gametes but are involved in delivery of the gametes in the reproductive process, penis, uterus, oviducts, etc. But then also other what we call secondary sexual characteristics, things that are involved in communication between males and females in the reproductive season. One of the things that we'll talk about when we talk about animal behavior is the fact that throughout the animal kingdom, the majority of cases where there is male and females trying to choose who to mate with, the females are much pickier than the males are. And so males have to work very hard to fight off other males in the process of trying to acquire a female or to convince females that they're the ones that should be chosen as a mate. And so this in involves during the breeding season, growing larger in body size, be, being more aggressive uh, in males, or males growing brighter colors and having very energetically expensive courtship displays. And that's what's seen here with this chestnut-sided warbler, which will migrate through here in uh, April and May every year uh, on its way to its breeding grounds. 
These males are incredibly brightly colored as the breeding season approaches and are very active singing. And this is all secondary sexual characteristics involved in trying to convince females to mate with them so that they can pass on their genes to the next generation. But during the non-breeding season, these uh, individuals are not singing and they molt into feathers that are much more camouflaged, much more subdued in coloration. Some of the key hormones that are involved in regulating the female cycles are estrogen and progesterone, and the key hormones regulating male cycles in general are called androgens, and the key one is testosterone. And here are just some of the chemical formulas for these. Um, don't, don't memorize these. They're just kind of here for um, demonstration purposes. So in a review, some animals are asexual in their reproduction, meaning a single parent gives rise to genetically identical young, meaning these individuals are clones. This can happen through binary and multiple fission, budding, fragmentation, and amiotic parthenogenesis. Other animals reproduce through sexual reproduction, the union of haploid gametes to produce genetically diverse diploid young, and this can happen in some species by having separate male and female individuals. These lineages are called dioecious. And in other animals, an individual is both male and female, meaning they're monoecious. Another form of sexual reproduction is meiotic parthenogenesis, where a female produces haploid gametes that can directly develop into offspring. What makes this sexual reproduction is these haploid gametes are produced through meiosis giving rise to genetic diversity in the offspring that are produced. We talked about the advantages to asexual reproduction and no need to find other individuals so it's faster. You can produce more individuals in a shorter time frame so the population can grow faster. And from an evolutionary point of view it's very efficient. You're passing on 100% of your genes. But the key advantage to sexual reproduction is the fact that you're producing genetic diversity in the offspring, which allows lineages to persist by adapting to changing environmental challenges. Gonads in animals can be broken up into testes, which produce sperm through spermatogenesis and ovaries, and females, which produce the ova through oogenesis. We talked about the three basic offspring production patterns, oviparous, in which eggs are shed out into the environment and basically develop with the yolk associated with the egg, ovoviviparous, in which the eggs are retained within the body cavity of the parent, but there's no direct transmission of nutrition from the parent to the offspring. The offspring have to get by in the egg with the yolk that's associated with this, and then they hatch and are born live birth. And this is the main difference between ovoviviparous and viviparous. In viviparous there's live birth, but there is no large egg with a yolk. The developing young is connected directly to the nutrition supply associated with the parent. And again, the best example of that is the placenta in mammals. And we talked about the fact that seasonal reproduction is the typical pattern in, in most animals where there's a reproductive season and then there's non-reproductive season. And the timing is, is set such that reproduction occurs in the season that it's easiest to get resources to feed young or to produce eggs that will uh, allow for greater success in the reproductive effort. And there are major morphological changes in animals throughout the year depending if they're in the reproductive season or the non-reproductive season.